Okay. In this scene we meet Kate, who's one of the central characters of the book. Kate's a little girl who wants to be a detective. And in this scene we meet her partner in our detective agency, who's called Mickey, who's a stuffed toy monkey. She was flustered to arrive at Venezia's restaurant a good 20 minutes past noon. This was not the way a professional operated. This was sloppy. She waited by the door to be seated, though she could see her table was still free. The same lady as usual took her to the same table as usual, and Kate slid into the orange plastic booth, which offered a view out over the main atrium of the centre. Do you need to see the menu today? asked the waitress. No thanks. Can I have the children's special please with a banana float? And can I not have any cucumber on the beef burger please? It's not cucumber, it's gherkin love. Kate made a note of this in her pad. Gherkins, cucumbers, not the same thing. Research difference. She'd hate to blow a cover on a stateside mission with a stupid error like that. Kate looked at the big plastic tomato shaped tomato sauce dispenser on her table. They were one of her favourite things. They made total sense. At school last term, Paul Roberts had read out his essay, The Best Birthday Ever, which culminated in his grandparents and parents taking him out to Venezia's for dinner. He spoke of eating spaghetti with meatballs, which for some reason he and everyone else in the class had found funny. He was still excited as he rushed through his story of drinking ice cream floats and ordering a Knickerbocker glory. He said it was brilliant. Kate couldn't understand why he didn't just take himself there on a Saturday lunchtime if he liked it so much. She could even take him for the first time and tell him the best place to sit. She could show him the little panel on the wall that you could slide back to reveal all the dirty plates passing by in a conveyor belt. She could tell him how one day she hoped to place some kind of auto-shutter action camera on the belt which could travel around the entire restaurant taking surveillance shots unseen before returning to Kate. She could point out the washing up man, who she thought might be murderous, and perhaps Paul could help her stake him out. She could maybe invite him to join the agency, if Mickey approved. But she didn't say anything. She just wondered. She glanced around to check that no one could see. Then she reached into her bag and pulled out Mickey. She sat him next to her by the window, so that the waitress wouldn't notice, and where he had a good view of the people below. She was training Mickey up to be her partner in the agency. Generally, Mickey just did surveillance work. He was small enough to be unobtrusive, despite his rather outlandish get-up. Kate liked Mickey's outfit, even though it meant he didn't blend in as well as he might. He wore a pinstriped gangster suit with spats. The spats slightly spoiled the Sam Spade effect, but Kate liked them anyway. In fact, she wanted a pair herself. Mickey had been made from a craft kit called Sew Your Own Charlie Chimp the Gangster, given to Kate by an auntie. Charlie had languished along with all of Kate's other soft toys throughout most of her childhood, but when she'd started up the detective agency last year, she thought he looked the part. Charlie Chimp was no good though. Instead, he became Mickey the Monkey. Kate would run through their agenda with him each morning, and he always travelled with her in the canvas army surplus bag. The waitress brought the order. Kate ate the burger and perused the first beano of the new year, while Mickey kept a steady eye on some suspicious teenagers below. He never expected to see anything on the CCTV. No one ever did on the night shift. He'd been looking at the same monitor screens for the past 13 years. When he closed his eyes, he could still see all the empty corridors and locked doors in soft grayscale tones. Sometimes he thought maybe they were just flickering photographs, still lives that would never change. But then she appeared in the middle of the night and he never thought that again. It was the early hours of Boxing Day. Green Oaks Shopping Centre closed only on Christmas Day and Easter Sunday and Kurt always worked both as part of the two-man skeleton crew. The customers didn't like it when the centre shut. On Christmas Day, he'd seen the usual small, angry crowd banging on the class doors, demanding admission. He'd watched them on the monitor and thought how like zombies they were. The undead demanding refunds and exchanges. Now in the security office, with only a beaten up Philips radio for company, 
He leaned back in the leather swivel chair and unscrewed the lid of his thermos. He wondered if it was too early to start his sandwiches. The DJ was dedicating Wichita Lineman to Audrey in Great Bar. Kirk quietly sang along with Glenn. Scott had drawn the short straw and was out in the darkness, patrolling the icy steel car parks around the perimeter. Kirk couldn't help but smile. The camera view changed and 24 new flickering vistas opened up on screen. On the top left monitor, he caught a brief glimpse of Scott walking diagonally across the bottom half of the screen. His breath was visible for a second before and after his image appeared. Kurt had a New Year's resolution. It was a week early, but he knew what it was already. It was easy to remember because it was the same as last year and the year before. He was going to quit his job and get out of Green Oaks, but this time he meant it. He'd never intended to stay in the job long, and now 13 years had passed and he didn't know where they'd gone. Patrolling empty corridors, eating sandwiches in the middle of the night, looking at his reflection in the one-way glass. He seemed incapable of leaving, something always held him back. It bothered him that life was slipping through his hands, and all he seemed able to do was watch it go. He had no ambition to do anything else, but he thought that he should. He closed his eyes and imagined a thermal image taken from high above, with him and Scott as two tiny red dots at the centre of a vast cold blue shadow covering the heart of the Midlands. In a few hours the centre would be packed with bodies, and Scott and he would be lost amidst all the other blobs of colour swarming and merging. Kurt had volunteered for a double shift, but was dreading the noise and confusion of the day ahead. The other guards had families and liked to spend bank holidays with them. In particular, they seemed to like spending their days with their families at Green Oaks, or sometimes, for a change, another shopping centre further afield. Kurt would see them grimly pushing their way through the holiday crowds, trying to enjoy life on the other side. Free time, what were they supposed to do with it? He bit into a fish paste sandwich and looked at his watch. It was 4am. Six to eight were the best hours of the shift for him. He loved to watch the first tentative encroachments made by the early wor workers. He liked to see the cleaners implacably removing all trace of the day before, wiping away fingerprints, brushing up hair, hoovering dust, tampering with the evidence. He felt his head being cleansed with every stroke. The screaming baby, the violent pensioner, the useless shoplifter, the desperate woman, the lonely man, the mysterious lift shitter, all deleted one by one, all sealed in bin bags and wheeled off down grey corridors to wait in waste containers. The sense of waking up was like a lullaby to him, which soothed and calmed him before he went home to sleep. As he reached for his crisp, something caught the corner of his eye and he looked back at the wall of monitors. He saw the figure standing in front of the banks and building societies on level two. It was a child, a girl, though her face was hard to see. She stood perfectly still, a notebook in her hand and a toy monkey sticking out of her bag. Kurt spun around to pick up his radio and signal Scott, and as he turned back to the screens he saw her disappear out of picture. He changed camera view, nothing. He rapidly clicked through each of the monitor's camera positions, but there was no sign of her. He was surprised to feel his tired heart beating hard as he called to Scott.